I'm Mayor Greg Bernicke. Uh, I guess about eight years ago, or a little over eight years ago, uh, one of the things that I ran on uh, running for mayor was to unleash the potential of Panama City. I'm sorry that it's taken this long. But had we done some of these things maybe a year or two ago, the hurricane may have blown them away. So maybe there was a you know, part of God's plan. We have gone through a horrific hurricane, and uh, we are going to take advantage of all of the things that, that the hurricane took away from us. We have a blank slate. We've talked about redoing downtown. We've talked about redoing Panama City. And now we have the chance. We have the right people in place. We've got the right city manager in place. We've put the right people on the bus, the right people on the right seats on the bus. And now, uh, after all the advertisement that we've done, look at the crowd that we've got here today. We're going to have total citizen involvement. Everybody and anybody that wants to be part of this process has been informed to be part of it. And they can be here tonight. And so tonight is the initial meeting. We're going to have uh, charrettes, I guess, the 17th to the 21st of June so that people can really get into the nitty gritty. Uh, right now, I'd like to turn it over to Haggerty and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. For those of you in the back and just joining us, we've got a few seats here up front if you want to be brave souls. We'll be friendly. Good evening, everyone. My name is April Jeruso. I'm with Haggerty Consulting. I'm the Director of Resilience. And we've been hired and, to, and brought in, along with many teaming partners, to um, help you visualize and realize the future of the city of Panama City. We're really excited to be here, uh, to be working with you on this. You all are, in talking with the mayor a little bit earlier today, I understand that we are here for this kickoff, but you're in the middle of your story. You're in the middle of the picture of, um, you, you've lived in this community for years, now we are recovering from Hurricane Michael. We understand that we are just a, a point in time and we're here to help you imagine, visualize, and realize the future of the city of Panama City. And it is essential that all of you provide us with the feedback, the input, and the priorities of where you wanna see your great community go. And so what we're doing here today, we have four main goals as we are sitting down with you all today, many of you standing with us. Um, and what we wanna do is to make sure that you understand the different lines of effort that we're all working on, the teaming partners that are involved and what we're doing, um, the timelines uh, for engagement, because we can't do this without your input and without your engagement. We want you to get to understand some of the launching point for uh, the visioning of the downtown and its waterfront um, as we engage and initiate this master planning process. And we want you to come back, be engaged, and spread the word from here forward. It is important that today you are here, that tomorrow you are here, and throughout this planning process and throughout the recovery and redevelopment process, you're here, you are engaged, you are a voice in the design of the future of this place. So just to briefly go over some project goals and vision, there are four lines of effort that have been identified as the priority. And as we, the planning and project team came in, we were handed these lines of effort, these priorities, safety and security, infrastructure, economy, quality of life. These are the goals for the future of Panama City, broadly speaking. How we shape and design these and evolve these is up to you. It's in your hands. And we're excited to work with you on them. But all of the projects, all of the lines of effort that we're responsible for, that we're going to be working on, are directly tied to these lines of effort. 
Everything sort of comes back to a grounding, to a foundation, to a baseline. And from there, the branches grow, and each of us go off, and we're doing our own uh, um, projects and, and establishing our own uh, deliverables related to those projects. So we're thinking about this in terms of learning from the past, where have we been as a community, and where do we want to be in the future as a community. And so there are a number of different projects that we're going to be working on in concert with one another. We are trying to make sure that if a conversation overlaps that relates to the master planning process as well as the economic development strategy, those, those projects, those end deliverables of those um, plans reflect that integration so that we're all speaking with one voice in the documents that it get delivered. Um, but the, so that the vision of the community is holistic, it's comprehensive, um, and it's thoughtful um, with this vision and these goals that you're establishing. So very quickly, there, there are four sort of lines of effort going on here. Recovery action planning, that's what Haggerty Consulting is, is primarily working on. We're working on an impact and unmet needs assessment, recovery action plan. Um, working on a disaster recovery plan, thinking about the future, and a redevelopment plan, thinking through not only based on Hurricane Michael, but also in the future, where does redevelopment go from here, based on priorities that are set forward in the next couple of months, and even thinking through the future beyond that. Our partners at HRNA are going to be working on an economic development strategy, working on an economic impact assessment, learning where are we today uh, based on past history of the economic um, growth of this community, based on uh, the impact of the hurricane, and then preparing for the future with a comprehensive economic development strategy. We have Dover Colon Partners here, um, and Victor will be talking in just a bit, launching the initiative for the master planning process. But, you know, learning from the past, we're thinking through the existing conditions of this community and visioning where we're going in the master plan that's being developed. And then throughout, community engagement. And we're so glad to have you here and amazed, amazed at the turnout. And so this is just a starting point with what engagement will be. We want to make sure that you have a voice at the table um, often that you are seeing the fruits of your labor, that the information that you're giving to us, you're seeing as direct results in the documents, in the progress reports that we're showing you of the documents that are coming along. And we want to just make sure that at the end of the day, you're bought into all of the documents and deliverables that are a part of this process, because at the end of the day, we are the temporary owners of this information to author, to shepherd, but we hand it over to you, and it is yours to own and, and see into fruition. And we're just so glad to be here for this. Um, I talked a little bit about community engagement. It is one of the main missions that has been put to us. We have um, a, a vast amount of um, initiatives going on to make sure that we are getting um, the voices uh, heard all of the voices to the table during the planning process. And so, um, you know, we want to understand your experiences, the goals you have for your community, the needs you have for your community um, post Michael or otherwise, um, and really establish an open line of communication so that we understand what these priorities are. And if the, the priorities sort of shift through the course of this process, we start to learn, understand, refine, hone in. We are engaging with you to understand more fully, are we capturing what you're hopeful for? Um, and how can we refine from here? So essentially, all of this feeds into all of the documents, all of the deliverables that we've got as our homework throughout the next six to eight months, where we are preparing for the next disaster, growing the economy, in, uh, improving the communications, continuing the enhancement of the communications with the community, um, and reimagining downtown and its waterfront. 
So this is just a snapshot of some of the very high level ways that we are engaging with you all um, in our plan between now and the end uh, of the summer through September, as it were. You see here in April and May, we're working through some kickoff meetings for all of the different initiatives. June and July, the mayor mentioned the design shred week. That is where not only is the master planning process really going to take shape and bloom, but also where the other lines of effort are going to be um, coming into play, where we're going to have meetings, um, progress reports, um, and establishing some community priorities based on w the information that we're gathering along the way, and some of the other focus group meetings, town halls, um, Mondays with the manager, and other venues where we're going to be capturing public engagement and your feedback and your priorities. We are planning to come back in August to talk through an update on how we're doing uh, with the various lines of effort that we're all working on. And then we are um, set to close out the planning process for all of the lines of effort in September. Now, um, I was talking to someone earlier today. They were like, well, what if there's some sort of, I don't know, something that occurs? I am a former emergency manager. Disasters is where I sort of lived and breathed. And so we're going to sort of take, a, um, uh, take you as our guide so that if there is another sort of impending priority that shifts um, the way that we're thinking about our schedule, we'll be open and flexible to that. But we are here to say that it is our um, goal to be accomplishing all of the deliverables um, in a timely fashion by the end of September so that you have something in hand, you have a roadmap in hand to get going, to hit the ground and run with each of the lines of effort and, and deliverables that you've got going on. Um, and you know which elements you own in your hands and where you go from here. Now, um, I'm going to hand it over to Victor. We're going to do a little bit of interactive polling uh, during this meeting. And we're going to start out with a test question here. This really is a test question of the technology and whether you remember. So I will tell you that the keypad polling uh, technique is something we use sometimes because it helps us find out who's in the room. And, and uh, of course, the dumbest question you could think of to ask is, what is your age? My, my mother, southern lady, said, don't say, how old are you? Say, or how old is she, or how old is he? Say, what age person is she? So we phrase it like that. The reason for asking this question is to make sure that the keypads are working properly. So uh, when we say the poll is open, and this one is open, you can press the button that corresponds with your answer, one for if you're less than 30 years old, two for 31 to 40, three for 41 to 50, four for 51 to 60, five, 61 years or older. This poll is open. You just press it. Now, if you change your mind or you remember you had a birthday and you change your answer, it will remember the last answer you gave, okay? They're still going. We've got 183 responses so far. So seeing that we're, we've got a response from a whole lot of people, probably nearly everybody in the room. We'll start a countdown. This will tell you in the bottom of the screen that there are five seconds left. Change your mind. Do it now. <laughs> and the answer is? You want to no, no. comment on that? Yeah. All right. Now, anybody who's been to a zoning hearing any time recently knows that this is not all that uncommon in public meetings in America. All right, so there are a couple of takeaways from this. One, number one, the most important, the technology works, so now we can ask you some more complicated questions. This is going to be a little bit like the SAT, where the questions get more difficult as we go. Okay? <laughs> but a whole lot of folks in the room are, are approaching or at or beyond retirement age, and a, a much smaller number of people from the up-and-coming younger generations are present. This is not at all surprising because they, those younger folks might be 
looking after kids on a school night or working two jobs or have a lot of other obligations that they have to take care of. So as we go through this process, not just in tonight's meeting, but over the coming month, I urge you to remember to think for yourself and about your own needs and your own responsibilities and desires, but also think about the other people who are not in the room, whether they might be somebody younger than you or someone from a vulnerable population or someone who can't come out at night, a shut-in, but other people who aren't able to be with us at the meeting but are also part of your community. And we also do these kind of questions because it, it, it uh, gives us a reminder that while there's a lot of people in this room, a lot, congratulations on getting such a big crowd out, it's not a scientific sample of the whole electorate, Mr. Mayor. It's a self-selected group of people who are volunteering Monday night to sit with us. And so we need your answers to all the questions to be done with the kind of open-mindedness that that suggests we should have. Go to the next one. We want to find out how you learned about this. This is such a, an overwhelming and surprising, delightful, big crowd. We want to know how you got the message. So how did you hear about tonight's meeting? Select all that apply. You can choose as many as seven things. And the last seven that you press are the ones that will be remembered. The poll is open. Answers are piling in. We're counting down. We got one undervote, one last person this time than last question. <laughs> undervote, that's a Florida term. <laughs> but look at this, phenomenal success across the whole range of things, but the most important one, uh, social media and right behind it, uh, the news. Now we have a starter question on recovery. Now remember tonight is a kickoff, not just for the downtown strategic master vision plan, but the, also for the citywide long-term recovery plan and all the four lines of effort that April described. We want you to choose two things that rise to the top of your primary interests. You may be interested in all of these. This is, it will be normal. The poll is open. The answers are piling in. A couple of hanging chads. <laughs> Just add another. Okay, the poll is closed. All right. Again, a, a broad range of things that are on people's minds uh, all the way across. With community planning and the economy uh, and housing uh, uh, rounding out the top three. I want to talk a little bit about one of those four lines of effort, which is the master plan or st the strategic master vision, some have called it, for downtown and its waterfront. Um, we are... Uh, are taking the downtown neighborhood as a piece, a tissue sample in a way, of the city as a whole and doing a deep, deep dive and detailed planning, visioning work for that over the coming month. So we'll go over what the schedule for that will be and what area it entails and what kinds of activities will take place in just a moment. But before we start that, I want to ask you what your main interests in downtown are. You can choose two, just like on the last question. We are talking about generally the area that uh, starts at Messalina Bayou on the east and extends west uh, to the tank farm. And it extends uh, on, uh, away from the water up to and just beyond 6th Street. So it's the core downtown around the Harrison Main Street area and uh, the neighborhoods on both sides. And the survey says, wow, a whole range of things. Uh, the biggest one is I attend things here, and then right behind it, I live here. Uh, I work with the community. See an equal split between those who work here and own property here. Um, now, a big chunk, 12%, said something else. Uh, how about a quick shout out? If you chose uh, number six for other, uh, why did you choose it? Anybody on this side? That yes. Can you say it a little louder? Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am? I frequent the stores and the restaurants. Stores and restaurants. Okay. Shop here. Restaurants. I live 60 plus years here, and just as all this started happening, I moved to Vernon. So. Okay. <laughs> 60 plus years, but when you answered the age question, you said 40, Robbie. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> we were watching your keypad. All right. Anybody else? Another reason that you might have chosen other? From this side of the room, let's say? Okay. 
Um, well, we'll continue along. This is an aerial photograph which kind of shows uh, why we think downtown is an important tissue sample to study. The downtown is the shared space for all the people who live in the whole city and many others around the city and the region. It's like the living room is to the house. You might have your own bedroom, but we all share the living room, right? And the waterfront is like the front porch. It's the threshold between this settlement and what is arguably your most important public space, which is St. Andrew's Bay itself. And so this is a place where we can do a plan and it will mean something to everybody in the city, not just to those who own property on Harrison or who have pioneered with businesses there, uh, but all the other people they need to support what they're doing. Uh, this is a, a rough line, which we will, I'm sure, look beyond as we, as we go. But it describes that area with Harrison in the middle uh, and the marina toward the waterfront. And so it includes uh, the city-owned properties along the marina and the old city hall, but it also stretches along the, the waterfront for a little ways to the west of that. And it includes over to the Masalina Bio uh, area. Now, we're doing this in several steps. The first one is underway here. That's what we're calling the kickoff and analysis phase. So over the last several weeks, we've been having teams here interviewing people, measuring things, taking photographs, gathering maps. Uh, this is Amy's second trip. This is Amy Groves, wave. Amy Groves, a principal and a long time, my longtime collaborator. How long have we worked together, Amy? 17 years. Um, and she's the project director on this effort. So uh, our economist and traffic engineer and so on are, have been here. Where's Rick? Rick Hall, the dean of modern American traffic engineers, no kidding, who happens to live in Tallahassee, so this is a quick place to get to, uh, is helping us with the transportation issues. We've been conducting some interviews and getting our maps together. That's the first step. The second step is going to get more interesting and bigger. Uh, we call it the design charrette. This is a fancy and confusing term. It is French. And I will just clarify that for you. Uh, a, a charrette is a, a multi-day long, usually about a week long, event that combines the features of a design studio and an old-fashioned town meeting and uh, community barn raising. Uh, we get people to, get, to come together under pressure of time in that short week to visualize what they want that place to be when it grows up. And we draw that. And we show it to you and say, is this what you meant? And we get your feedback, we revise it, and we ask you again, well, how about this? Is this what you meant? Until we can find the common ground among many, many people who are participating. That's what happens in a charrette. And uh, the, there are three big pieces to know about the schedule within the charrette. The first one is on Monday night, June 17th. Write that down in your calendars. Monday night, June 17th. We're going to have a, the start of that week an uh, interactive, hands-on design session. This is the most fun of the, whole fun of the whole thing. It'll also be the loudest and the most creative, uh, the, the, mo the least predictable uh, and, uh, of all the events, because we're going to take the, uh, as big a crowd as you can bring and divide into small groups, surround tables, and work over maps. I'll describe how that happens. Then after we're done with that meeting, that night, we will set up a temporary design studio here in this building, uh, in this room. This is, we're going to take this over. We're going to set up computers and drawing boards and, um, and uh, make an uh, ad hoc conference room. And we'll be having uh, meetings on technical topics and drawing things uh, to try and take your many plans and blend them into one. And then at the end of that week, on Friday night, June 21st, we'll have a work in progress presentation. We'll put our pencils down. We'll bring you back together auditorium style. We'll ask you to look up on the screen and see if the ideas you brought to us Monday night have made their way into the work we're showing you as work in progress. You may see your idea, but it's over there where your neighbor suggested <laughs> to put it. You may see your idea, but twice as long and three times as, as skinny or something. Or you may see your idea that you drew in blue, but it's over here and it's in green. So you may actually see the, our effort, we'll try to show our work as we go, to combine your many ideas into one, where they make sense. Now, everybody always asks, 
Um, does that mean that uh, just by showing up, we get to make all the final decisions? That's not, that's not what it means. What it means is we're going to try and build together a plan we can present with a straight face to your mayor and elected officials and your city manager and say, this is our best advice to you based on everything we learned from the public input process where advisable. And it also represents our best advice to you as your consultants. So you'll get the expert opinions and you'll get the combination of all the effort that, that you volunteer. Now, you'll want to go to the website a few times between now and that week, June 17th through 21st, uh, rebuildpc.org, and look for the schedule of events because new things are being added to that all the time. Um, and it's breaking really fast. Now, that first noisy meeting I described where we break into small groups and work around maps, we're going to ask people who don't normally sit together, who may come from very different backgrounds or different neighborhoods or have different ideas to sit together. Maybe even some of you will sit down with your lifelong sworn enemy <laughs> and talk about what, what you can agree on. Find common ground and mark it on the map. And at the end of that event, we will ask each small group to make a rapid fire presentation to all the others. And we will be listening to those presentations to see where, what they have in common, where, where there are things you can agree on. You will probably agree on 80 or 90% of it. That's just a prediction. That will warn us, that will tell us that that other 10% is complicated and we're going to have to spend time on it to sort out the contradictions. And that's a lot of fun. If you haven't done it before, plan uh, to roll up your sleeves, get a magic marker on the side of your hand, uh, and try and outdraw your neighbors. Now, when we're set up in here for the design studio, that's a time when you can drop, drop in, look over our shoulders. If you sit up in the middle of the night with a great idea, you can come over the next morning and tell us about it. Okay, and the rule of thumb there is if you bring food, more of your ideas will get into the final plan. <laughs> I'm only kidding. That's just a, that's just a joke. We'll send, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll send you a menu. No. Friday night, we're going to get back together like this. Um, the exact locations for these events are, are being worked out. But we're going to get back together where you can all look up on the big screen and check it. And then we will ask you, is this what you meant? And we will pass out a survey or give you some way to give feedback on what you've seen. Like which of the ideas you saw are the most interesting to you that you want us to pursue further. And where you have concerns about missing information or someone that we should reach out to that we haven't yet heard from. The third step in this is where we take all that work up and take it back to our offices and in tight communication with the city and your leaders as we go, we will boil that down into documents that are part of these um, work deliverables, work products that April described before. And that will describe the community vision. It will have drawings in it. Uh, it will include visualizations, what if kinds of things, and prescriptions. The most important thing it says, on how to implement, it'll say, do these things, A, B, C, D, E, so that you have a clear roadmap to going on implementing. Because while we want to think together about very long term, we also want to leave your leaders with consensus about what to do starting right now to implement your vision for downtown. I'll end with just a little bit of what I hope is confidence building for you. Every place that we go to visit, um, and enjoy being there is a place where somebody did the exercise that we're describing to you now. They undertook community planning. Um, it, this is the Savannah waterfront for those who don't recognize it. I picked it at random, but it seemed like a good example because it's a proud, historic, and beautiful waterfront. It doesn't look this way or it doesn't give people the good feelings it gives them when they visit or they live there because uh, it came naturally out of the ground like just sprung up organically. It doesn't look that way because it came from the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. It looks that way because people drew lines on a map. People just like all of us in this room, they said, let's make it this way, not that way. Let's choose our future. This is a good moment to pause for a question about what I've described so far. Anybody have a question about the procedure for that magical week? Yeah. Okay, so the most important thing to remember is 6.30 p.m. on Monday, June 17th, because that's the, that's the, the big community gathering where we're going to ask you to put pencils to paper and show us your ideas.
that's the most important thing to remember. And the schedule between now and then for the remainder of the week will probably adjust a little bit. We're getting some bigger venues because we have so much interest. That sort of thing is being worked out. And then uh, Friday night, 6 p.m., is that correct, Amy? Friday night, 6, 6 p.m. on Friday, June 21st is the next most important time to remember. That's when we'll do the work in progress presentation. Um, yeah, just ladies and gentlemen, let's hear his question. No, the reason I ask is I've done transportation this year before, and it takes all day long. Yeah. We're, you sit in a room from like 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock or 6 in the evening, you know, and they bring in food, and they're going to have to get up and get out and get out and get out and get out and so the, this is a great question. We are, that's why we're going to set up a shop in here and set up a bunch of tables to draw on and draw all week. So this event will not end Monday night when we adjourn for the evening. We'll just decamp uh, from there and come over into here and set up. And then we're going to work virtually around the clock until Friday night. We'll also do uh, an abbreviated recap on Saturday morning for folks, folks who just can't come Friday night. Friday night's the main event. Please promote that as the best time to hear the whole story. But for those uh, who won't be able to be with us Friday night, we'll, we'll have a recap Saturday morning. Yes, ma'am? Uh, the question is, are we reaching out to the schools? Somebody from the outreach team, can you answer that question? Yes. yes. The answer is yes. Okay. We have a large, we have a, a, a very large uh, stakeholder engagement team, um, not only on our end, but then also we're coordinating heavily uh, uh, with the city of Panama City. We are heavily engaged with the school district, and so we'll be um, involving. Outreach is what you can dream of, so if you can think of groups um, that you want invited to the table, let us know. Please find one of us personally so that we can get the contact information, the best contact information to get the word out to that stakeholder group. Um, please let us know. The more, the better. Did you? The manager says we have FSU and Gulf Coast involved as well, so students at the higher level too. Did you notice how everybody quieted, quieted it right down when April started answering a question? She didn't need the whistle. I'm very jealous. Uh, so uh, remember, never use punchlines in PowerPoint. Don't say any of you think that was great. Take a look at this, because that's when the projector will go off, apparently. What I was saying is that Savannah Riverfront didn't turn out like that because uh, by accident. It turned out like that because people did a drawing. And th this is the drawing, actually. This is o General Oglethorpe's plan for Savannah. Um, so now we're going to do General McQueen's plan for Panama City. <laughs> actually, Mark, this, is, this little here, if you, if you look at the um, legend for this map, that little thing right there is identified in the legend as Mr. Oglethorpe's tent. So General Oglethorpe camped out right there. Uh, while they were basically starting the town from scratch in the wilderness. But at the beginnings, right at the beginning, they did a drawing. This is where the streets go. Here's where the squares are. And so the initial genius of the plan was drawing lines on a map. And that was done when Savannah was a single-family, detached house, large lot, low-density subdivision. Now, here's the good news. You've had maps like that, too. The original plat for your town has the same kind of features, like an idea for how the land meets the water and an idea for where the main street goes and how the streets interconnect in a network of blocks. Um, so just to identify, that's Harrison right there. And you can, in those days, the big marina uh, wasn't extended out into the bay. It was a long pier at the end of the street. And so in, in that time period, your great-great-grandfathers and your grandfathers were actually living in an America that was poorer but smarter and really good at this urban design city planning stuff and good at architecture too. So at that point, right on that intersection on Harrison, they were already building buildings that were proud city-like buildings, you know, the ones that belonged on a main street. They stood up straight like the bank. And if you look closely at this drawing, at this photograph, that's the kind of architecture they were presenting toward the street when the street was still unpaved. When, so that's, that's what they knew they were up to here. They were building a place they wanted to last and they wanted it to be really great. The, the waterfront was also traditionally the gathering place. So like on the 4th of July, people would come to the waterfront. And uh, that's what I meant about that 
shared space. It's changed a lot over time. So the, originally there was a long pier, and then later the pad of the marina was extended out and extended out again uh, over the years. So what I'm describing to you is that it's a normal thing to do a drawing and then update your drawing and visualize change before it occurs and make decisions about what kind of change you want. So then you're basically choosing your future. And we do a lot of picture making in the process of the sort that we're going to be doing together here in June. We do before and after pictures. We like to tell people, you know, squint and look at a place that you know. Imagine what you would like to turn it into. This is one we did for Atlanta not long ago in the south downtown area for Atlanta. Or they're reimagining their main streets. You may have seen that on the national news. That's a simulation. But we can also show you pictures along those lines of real places that have been built after that same exercise. So in downtown South Miami, for example, uh, Pam, you'll remember this is a, a spot which was kind of dead space in the center of town, just an unforgotten alley, a lot of pavement. And then that was turned into a street that's uh, one of the favorites in town, kind of the social center of the community because of an exercise just like this one. In fact, more like this one uh, than you might realize. Th they did this charrette process and the master plan in November of 1992. Anybody remember what happened in August of 1992? Right. The roof of several of these buildings was blown off and landed on the U.S. Highway 1. <laughs> And yeah, we had a big storm. And so in November of 19, 1992, we had boarded up storefronts and roofs missing from buildings and lots of blue tarps everywhere. And the trees were all down. And the, the process of doing that planning came right after the storm. Um, now, uh, you don't have to have a storm to realize you need to do timely upgrades. So how many of you thought reimagining re downtown should be a priority long before a storm hit? OK, it's, it's time. Uh, some of you may know Park Avenue and Winter Park. That's a city for which we did a similar kind of downtown revitalization plan. And while it never uh, hit as low an ebb as some of our other historic communities, um, Park Avenue did need an upgrade. I want to show you this picture because of that tree right there on the right side. That tree was planted in 1997. So it's a 22-year-old tree. If you get the planting detail right and you think about it and you design it so that it can thrive, you can have big trees that grow shade and make a nice sidewalk to walk on. Don't let them tell you you can't do that. Um, there's a, a spot in Montgomery, Alabama, which just happens to be a pretty historic spot where Rosa Parks caught the bus um, back at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and they upgraded that location around their court square and, and they had this historic fountain into being a plaza, which right where the road turns at an angle, we thought maybe not unlike what you have to grapple with with Harrison's geometry. Now we're in Chattanooga, for example, where Main Street, that's the name of that street, had all of the buildings, I don't mean most of the buildings, I mean all of the buildings boarded up in 1997, and now Main Street looks like that. Yeah. And they didn't uh, polish it up too much. They also kept all the rusty stuff and the, and the things that gave it character, and they made big art out of it, and they shined attention on the fact that they were a historic railroad town. So the, those places don't look like one another. They look like what the people in those towns wanted them to look like, which is why we're proposing design in public. And we have a couple of poll questions. And I realize now that we don't have the big screen, these are going to be harder to read. So I'm going to read them aloud. This question is, how often do you go downtown? One for very often, as in every day. Two for often, just about every week. Three, sometimes, at least once a month. Four for rarely, a couple of times a year. And five for never. And the answer is, a whole lot of the people in this room are there all the time, every day or every week. A really small number of people are coming seldom. Uh, that's pretty great, because what that tells us is that if they could get those storefronts open, there's a whole lot of people to sell things to. So all right, good to know. Now this one's going to ask about why you're there. And we want you to select up to three. So remember, if you change your mind, it will remember the last three buttons you push. The primary reasons I go downtown are, and you may pick three, one, to work, two, to eat, three, to shop, 
for, for public services, like going to a, a, a city hall, five for special events, six for religious events at one of the places of worship, and seven for I live there. So this is going to be answered by, the, uh, by everybody except the 1% who said never in the previous question. <laughs> wow, a whole lot of people go to eat. Number one is to eat and right behind it for special events and then an even split between public services, shopping, and working. What is most important to increase or upgrade downtown? Now, this time we want you to pick one because it's the most important. And as I read this list, you're going to realize they're probably all important. So you're going to have to choose one that rises to the very top. Okay? What is most important to increase or upgrade downtown? Number one, open spaces like parks, squares, plazas. It can be increase or upgrade. Two, for community facilities related to the arts or education or civic functions. Number three, main street shops and restaurants. Number four, housing and lodging. Five, for safer and more beautiful streets. And six, for something else. What's the most important to increase or upgrade downtown? The poll is open. Wow, look at that. Main street shops and restaurants, head and shoulders above the others, but housing right behind it, housing and lodging. Okay. Now, just out of curiosity, someone who said something else, what are we missing? Anybody who picked something else as their number, as the main thing to increase? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, yeah, lodging was meant to include that, but your great point could have been clearer. Well, it sound, lodging sounds jargony, doesn't it? Okay, next time we'll fix that. Okay, any other? Any, anyone else pick something else and wants to volunteer what that was? I'm trying to see what we've missed. All right. Let's say again. Food trucks, okay. Increase or upgrade. You, <laughs> increase the food trucks or upgrade them. Next. Okay, so this is open mic time. That means we're going to walk it around. I'm going to follow the Oprah Winfrey rule. Do you know what that is? Never let go of the microphone. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it out to you, and then I'll put it closer to your face, because that's what you have to do to be heard, and then I will take it back. So don't try and grab it from me. Any, who wants to go first? What's important to you? We have a question for you as a prompt. We do. You wanna... Do you have the... Okay, so here's a, here's a way to start this and hopefully start it in an important positive way. If you could solve only one of the challenges the city is currently facing due to Hurricane Michael, what would that be? If you could solve only one of the challenges the city is currently facing, you could solve one, what would that be? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're a wise man. I'm going to do it like this. The infrastructure that, okay. that's already come crumbling before we even started with the storm. It okay. needs to be replaced entirely. All right. I'm going to make my way this way first. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, I'm an Uber driver, so I got a lot of people that told me what they did and why they stayed and all the ramifications. Uh, You're a Human communications device. Yes. Um, we were talking about a lot of the people that were displaced and weren't able to come back. What happened, I believe, was that a lot of contractors came in and took what was left before the residents that left could come back and get back, you know, get their apartments back or get new apartments. So I was thinking if it ever happens again, we should be ready to put the contractors like in tent cities or recreational vehicles and not let them take apartments that are uh, that should be given to st students and people that that live here. Um, April, this, she's talking about preparing for post-disaster recovery the next time. Do you want to just bring she, that up? Sure is. Yes. Yeah, so what? You did great. Didn't she do great? Yes. And we think it's important too. And so one of the one of the elements that we are going to be working with the community on is a pre-disaster recovery plan. I know it sounds strange to be working on a pre-disaster recovery plan in a post-disaster environment. Can you guys hear me with this? It's very breathy. <laughs> <laughs> Turning on and off. But what we are doing, what we're ensuring that we're doing is to make sure that you all are effectively prepared for the next time something comes around. Making sure that everything that you've learned as a result of this process, um, the best practices, the lessons learned, and, and so on and so forth are captured and codified in a plan so, the, so that you, the community, and uh, the government that serves you, the community, knows how to effectively sort of organize, 
need the microphone for the taping. And then, so we are planning for that in the pre-disaster recovery planning effort. So that's going to be going on towards the end of the summer into, um, into, the, into the fall season when we're sort of codifying everything that we're learning here in the recovery planning environment. Uh, in the recovery action planning environment and then codifying it in a pre-disaster recovery plan for the next time. We have taken a note of that comment and want to make sure that we want to gather that and, and um, take it in and make sure it's part of the plan. April, you've reminded me that that week when we do the design week, the, the charrette, when we do that, we are going to have all that fun work going on about the downtown, but we will also have people here who are working on the citywide components like the one she just described having meetings and, and sessions related to those as well. And we'll be using the same rooms. And so if you want to talk about a citywide issue like that, don't stay home because you heard that that week is only for downtown. Because there was plenty of opportunity to talk about the things that apply citywide as well. Yes, sir, what was your idea? Uh, my name is Frank DiPinto, uh, for 1400 Frank. Gulf Avenue. Frank, you're my, you're my pen pal. I get emails from you every day. We <laughs> <Bring> meet. <laughs> Glad to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'll share some of those communications with the rest of the group. Uh, the biggest challenge um, uh, Panama City has, and that is even before uh, Hurricane Michael, is that Panama City and the marina doesn't have any easy vehicular access. It's a landlocked city on, uh, by 15th Avenue, 23rd Avenue. The, the flow of traffic is east-west and not north-south. In order to get people down here to use downtown, to use a hotel or whatever, you need easy access downtown and to somehow figure that out. All right. Thank you, Frank. I'm going to make my way back, and then I'm coming your way, ma'am. I found Frank. Hi. What's your name? Uh, Bambi. Maybe. Um, affordable housing to keep employees here because there's so many people who are leaving because they can't afford to stay here. I mean, the cost of living has gone up. What I was spending last year before the hurricane in groceries, I've now doubled on my single mother income. On top of trying to find a place to live and being displaced after the storm, and we're like, I'll just take a one bedroom and we'll all just make it work. There's three of us, it'll be fine but we can't find anything on my income, on my budget. And so, and I'm not the only one, I mean, and not just that, there are people who, I, I work for a church, and there are people who call every day, and there was a woman who called me just at the end of last week, and she said that she has taken care, of, she's 70 years old, she's on disability, and she's taking care of her five grandchildren. She lives in a home that was destroyed by Hurricane Michael that she's renting. Her landlord will not fix it, will not remove the debris from her house, and he's told her he has doubled her rent, and she has to pay it by the end of the month or get out. And this is not the only person with that story in Panama City. And it's just heartbreaking that people are losing their hope because they have nowhere to live, and it just seems like it's getting worse. Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you, Bambi. <clears throat> Were you waving? You Okay. Today I was taking a lady around trying to find uh, uh, some place for her to live, a one bedroom. She's a senior citizen. We went to several places and they said a one bedroom would be a thousand yep. some dollars. And, and she's on a, a month, thousand dollars a month, but she's on disability. She doesn't get about $900 a month, but um, she can't afford it. So that's the issue that we have today, is this how they have hiked up. And the lady said, well, uh, it's just increased since Hurricane Michael. Now, where is people supposed to get that extra money from that, to pay? Nobody's given, she doesn't get uh, any, it, she doesn't get anything. So where is she supposed to get money from? And it really is hurting. It, it's, 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 you know, hurting to see people in this condition. My name is Catherine Richardson. Yeah. Um, we're, we're recording, so we want to, if we need to track any of you back down to ask you for more, more detail. Um, I'm going to come back around after everybody's had a chance, okay? Um, yes, sir. 
the most attractive, as long as you're in the in inception of rebuilding the downtown, Fred Shear. Right. All right, thanks for being here, Fred. Well, thanks for inviting everybody. This is a great idea, and thanks for the open mic. Uh, uh, the most attractive cities, especially around uh, waterfront, if they could concentrate on uh, wood fronts, something uh, and and soften it with greenery, all the greenery you can possibly put in, and st and uh, avoid if they can the brick here and then the yellow building on the outside and the, and that sort of stuff. Just I know it's a little a long run, but now that you're rebuilding, this might be the time to design the most comfortably and most inviting downtown you can. And the others, uh, one more aspect of the town, whoever divi uh, desi uh, designed that traffic way in front of of the Civic Center, Mad Ludwig, you might want to rethink that. I know it costs a lot of money, but uh, you know that's that's not a comfortable way to get around for the entertainment. Uh, venue. That's on the map and on the table. I think it's good. Yes, sir. I'm in your way. What's your name? Tony Bostic. Tony, thanks for being uh, here. Thank you. At Haggerty, as a group, are you going to come up with a strategy or a plan to? pitch to Mayor Britnicki and the city and the leaders here for, as the, lady, the young lady was talking about earlier, um, price control on the rental properties, on the existing houses. Uh, no one wants to talk about the fact that rent control districts work. The landlords here are, are just robbing people. And the elderly here, which is a big concern of mine, they can't afford this. They don't have the income to support this. Inextricably, inextricably tied to this is the wages here. The wages here don't meet the cost of living here. And so are you guys going to put together a plan to pitch to the city to somehow bring these two into a, a, a more equal balance? I think that's a great question. The work, <laughs> as do others. Um, the work that we are doing is to identify the priorities. We, Haggerty, consulting specifically is to work through the priorities that are being identified for the recovery of your community. Housing has come up in every conversation that we've had thus far. We understand it's a priority for your community to rebuild, to recover effectively, to thrive again, to have community members who lived here live here again. So certainly this is going to be a part of the recovery action plan. Additionally, the economic development plan sort of speaks to the, uh, the, the workforce um, uh, that you are, are um, identifying, wanting to enhance and grow here in the community. And of course, that has a nexus from one to the next. So um, economic recovery, housing, community development, infrastructure, all of these concepts that you guys have been talking about are going to be a part of this plan. Now, I say that, but it needs to be informed by you. We're asking specific questions about what about the infrastructure? Is it that you're looking to enhance the plan? So right. these things, these priorities that you're setting forth in saying that affordable housing is necessary for the people who work here, who love this community to stay here, that is going to be a part of the, the recovery action plan to um, implement steps to get to a place where you are better able to come back to the table. There are policy recommendations tied with all of those that you are asking about. And so where there are policy recommendations, we'll identify those um, in terms of courses of action and next steps, as well as um, the ability to pay for this type of recovery and redevelopment as well, um, and the programs tied with them. That is our charge, not only saying, what the community wants, but how do you then implement that? What are the cost solutions to get that recovery in action? Thank you, April. What's your name, sir? I'm Stephen Linney. Steve? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, the mayor's yeah. got to follow up. <laughs> you want to come to the podium over here, sir? You know, this is a question of supply and demand. And when we get some housing money appropriated, and people start building more units, the prices will come down. But in the meantime, if you have, there are people that are gouging. We've got the phone numbers for uh, Attorney General Ashley Moody's office and also Jimmy Petronas's office. If you want to call City Hall, we will report those issues. Or we will give you the phone numbers 
of who to rep of of the specific issue. In other words, you've got a person that's was paying X, now they're paying X. You know who that person is. We will report those people. Okay? We want to do that because I don't I don't I don't know how long it's going to take before we get the housing. But if we need a thousand units and somebody comes in and builds a thousand units, that person that's gouging that person isn't going to have anybody in their in their uh, in their place. So uh, let's. Call in City Hall, and we'll get those people reported. Thank you, Mayor. All right, Stephen, your turn. Oh, yes, I'm Stephen Linney. So uh, I was living out in Callaway, and I, I actually, uh, the last three people who spoke, I agree 100% with what they're saying. I think the most important thing is definitely housing. Uh, infrastructure is obviously necessary, but you have people living in tents, and uh, one of my neighbors, I lived out in Callaway. I had to move. I had to buy a house because I couldn't find a place to rent. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not poor, I'm not struggling, but, you know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck, and I had to, I had to go buy a house. That's the only way I could get out of my situation, because a single bedroom, uh, a one bedroom, one bath on the beach is $2,200 a month when I was, when I was looking for somewhere to rent, and my landlord also wasn't willing to, uh, or wasn't getting people, everyone else on my street and on Lake Drive in Callaway was getting their roofs repaired, while my roof was still leaking and I had mold growing on my walls. So I had to go on the, up on the roof and, and fix it myself. Now, while I was down uh, getting supplies from Home Depot uh, to fix my roof, I uh, was talking to the uh, young lady there and, and asking how things were going. And they can't find anyone to work there. They're at half staff. So I, I just want to reiterate, I think the most important thing is housing because if no one has anywhere to live, they're not going to be able to come to the city and work a job. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Any more back here before? I, okay, yes, sir. Okay. Is this the corner? <laughs> I'm going to work my way that way, and then April, you call time. When, yeah, maybe like three more questions. Okay. I think also piggybacking on that, um, I think the storm created a real food desert, like in certain locations. Um, there are certain locations has some restaurants, and we have some, uh, you know, Publix and Lucky's, which you know we can afford, but. Some of the grocery outlets are gone, so especially in certain sides of the uh, community. I think that's a big deal, too. All right. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> what was your name again? Jeremy Bunk. Jeremy, thank you. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Please speak into my the name's microphone. Laura Casey. Um, my husband and I were both born and raised here. However, I live here, but my husband has to work in Little Rock, Arkansas, because he can't find a job in Panama City that will pay wages enough for us to live on. So we need, clearly, housing for low income. We need, because we have plenty of jobs for entry level and Home Depot, Lowe's, restaurants. Everybody's looking for somebody. However, we don't have any technology jobs. We don't have any higher jobs to support. Um, the lower level, like waitresses and, and cops and, and firemen, you need, a, you need tiered development. Mm -hmm. We need higher wage jobs along with the lower wage jobs. We need the, the, the housing. We need a structured tiered development. All right, thank you. So a couple back this way. Pardon me, I'm going to slip through. And as yes, Victor's sir. making his way over, I do want to say that we do have comment cards. Um, folks from our team will wave those in the air. And if you aren't able to, um, you know, specifically write down your comment that you had or, or the one element that you had, um, what you can do is write that down. We'll collect it. We'll make sure to aggregate that information as All well. Right. Thank you, April. What's your name, sir? My name's Brian Hodges. Hi, Brian. Um, Speaking of the mic, close to the mic so they can all hear you, and you're, there's a camera look, six feet away looking right at you. Uh, no pressure, right? The question I have is, is part of this uh, development planning going to include the small businesses that survive the hurricane? There's a lot of us out there in the support industry that have bulked up our sellable item inventory, our employment, as well as our you know, inv um, equipment inventory. Is part of this planning session going to guide small businesses as to how to uh, survive what we bulked up on to support all the 
everybody that came in. Thank you. I mean, I think that that is an excellent question. Um, I think that it is definitely a part of the work that we will be doing on our end on the recovery action plan. Um, the business community is essential. The small business community is essential. And so what we can do is um, determine the best venue to collaborate with the small business community. I don't know if you all have a group where you regularly meet. Perhaps we um, establish a focus group on the small business community. Additionally, the economic development piece is um, of essential importance, and the small business community is is certainly a part of of, of that. Yes. Do you think if we if we set a time aside for a huddle with just folks and like you just described the people in small businesses, uh, that you could help us recruit a group to sit and go through the issues with us with our economists on hand and and uh, talk it out during the design week? I truly think that the, uh, the turnout you give for staff. All right, you're on. You're on. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. One final question. Tell them your name. Hi, my name is Vinny Augusta. Um, I just moved here. <laughs> I haven't lived here my whole life. But uh, I think something that is important, uh, I, I heard a lot of buzzwords during this presentation, and a lot of them apply very well. One word I didn't hear that typically I cringe at, because it's usually about green cars or whatever, is sustainability. Hmm. And uh, I think it ties into kind of what you said. Sure, we can build all the houses, and we can try and get whatever we want for infrastructure, and we can build gold bridges, but we have to be able to sustain it after your whole team leaves, after your team leaves. We need to be able to support our community, and we don't want to kind of, to use a real estate term, price ourselves out of the neighborhood. It's a great uh, classic definition of sustainability, which is, Sustainable development meets the needs of the present generation without foreclosing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So why don't we all just take that as a reminder and keep that in the front of our heads as we work over the coming weeks. Thank you for that. I, um, I, this gentleman's been waiting. Can we get one more in, April? Okay. Yes, right, one you. final. All right, yes, sir, what's your name? Ron, Ron Sharp. Ron. Uh, Bay County currently is doing a recovery plan as well. Yes. How will our plan uh, piggyback, yes. uh, align, or differ? Yes. Great. Well, I think we are using that as not something to ignore. We recognize that it, a lot of work has gone in, on into that planning process. We want to review it. We want to review it with a community, identify things that speak to you all as a community, priorities that speak to you all as a, com uh, a community, to build upon those. And where your priorities differentiate or differ, we'll, we'll differentiate the plan in those ways. We are not here to reinvent wheels or processes. We don't want to sit down and re-examine questions that you've already uh, examined. We hope to really build off of that plan so that the, the city is in lockstep with the county, who then informs the state what they are hopeful for, so that you are able to sort of build a holistic picture where everybody's in lockstep with one another, speaking on the same page, saying this is where the county is, here's where in the city we're implementing um, priorities that are identified at the county level. Here's where we are enhancing and sort of growing or differentiating ourselves from that as well. We are to in total acknowledgement of that great work, that plan, um, and want to make sure that we are building upon it and, and working together uh, with the county and the community. Um, because why, why, why do the work twice? But we understand that you are unique here, and therefore we need to build a plan that is unique to the city and specific to the city. As we're wrapping up just a couple of things, um, Hope Winship would be really upset with me if I didn't remind you all that there's this website that's been constructed for this process. It's going to be growing with material. Rebuildpc.org, that's a screenshot of it. Um, if you go to rebuildpc.org over the coming weeks, you're going to see more and more material put there and there's a, a vehicle uh, at that website for you to submit feedback as we go. Just one last thought, remember that all of us grew up, as this old saying goes, uh, sitting in classrooms that we didn't build and enjoying the shade of trees that we didn't plant and that's because somebody else did the kind of work 
you're doing by coming here. Why don't you all join me in giving your elected officials a, a round of applause for conducting this meet. Thank you all.